I'm making a game inspired by Mario Kart, Crash Bandicoot, and Grand Mountain Adventure. Welcome to Devlog 6. Alright, so the first item on my to-do list was menu screens. It was time to add in a graphics settings page, and I also want to make sure that the menus work just as well on a controller as they do with the mouse and keyboard. I thought for a while about how to fit all these different screens into the signpost concept I had started a few months ago before deciding it was taking too long, and I'd rather be spending my time working on gameplay. So at least for the time being, I've moved to a less exciting but decidedly easier to implement menu layout. One thing I had a bit of fun with was this waving flag animation. This flag was actually simulated in Blender and exported as a transparent video, and I'm thinking these animated silhouettes could be a pretty cool theme for the in-game UI. Finally, I added some really basic modals for things like joining and hosting servers. Next, I wanted to add some structures to the level to help sell the sense of scale, and my friend Ghost suggested these wooden outposts that I thought would look really cool here. I started by blocking out the tower locations and a couple other future props as well. So I sculpted the basic wooden boards I would need and laid them out according to the reference photos. I've been trying to get better at asset creation, and one of the things I've been working on is reducing the amount of textures by baking more objects onto a single map and reusing parts of that texture as often as possible. Additionally, I was looking through the Unreal content examples recently when I found this method for faking windblown cloth physics in a vertex shader, similar to how modern games animate grass blowing in the wind. This was an exciting breakthrough since it's much more performant than cloth physics and it allows me to use a lot more flags in my level design. I also took some of those same wooden boards to make ramps, and these will come in handy once we get to the movement mechanics. Back to UI elements, it was time to add a race start countdown. Again, this visual is pretty straightforward, but I'm focused on just making the game playable right now. And um, that's not quite what's supposed to happen, but I think you get the picture. Moving on, the top comment from my last video suggested making the cave sequence into an ice cavern and having some kind of creatures frozen in the ice around the passage. I really liked this idea and thought it'd be a great way to make the cave more visually distinct. I played around with a couple different methods for creating the icy walls of the cave before I finally found a method I liked. I also manually modeled the entrance and the exit to the cave, and this was a very tedious process. So here's what it looked like before, and here is what it looks like now. I still have yet to add the frozen creatures, but it's on the to-do list. Additionally, a few people suggested having the ice shard stick into the ground instead of explode on impact, which I thought was a really good suggestion. Here's what that looks like. However, now the exploding effect feels kind of out of place, so I've switched to have the ice shards freeze the player on collision, which I think looks and plays way better. Next, I took a crack at updating these rock walls, and you know, it's still a work in progress. Speaking of rocks though, I got around to adding some cliffs to the landscape to break up the snow. I did this by basically cutting up a bunch of shapes to match the general look of the cliffs that I wanted, and after getting the shapes right, I added some sculpted details to the cliff faces, and I think these rocks really make the landscape look more epic. One item I hadn't touched in a while was the penguin missile, and while I was updating the movement component to solve some latency issues, I accidentally triggered this bouncing effect, which I thought, with some tweaking, could be really cool. I found that the bounce gives the penguin missile some real personality, and unique qualities that set them apart from their equivalents in other games, like the green shell in Mario Kart. I also took the time to make sure that obstacles could be destroyed by penguin missiles, and this can be a very useful way to clear the path ahead of you. And with that done, I spent a bit of time on the snow particle effects. After looking carefully at the shadows and the dynamic lighting of the snow in Grand Mountain Adventure, I decided to spend a day experimenting with volumetric effects, and was pleasantly surprised by the results. To put it as simply as possible, the idea behind volumetric rendering is that instead of describing vertices and triangles like you would with standard rendering techniques, you are instead describing the density of a volume in a given 3D space. This is especially useful when rendering amorphous moving shapes like smoke or clouds. It's still got a ways to go, but in general I think the volumetric snow gives depth to the snow plumes and really adds a lot to the mayhem of multiplayer. 
Next, I decided it was time to give our wolf character a tail. And look, I'm trying to keep this as PG as possible, so I'm just going to skip over all these jokes I've got written down. And I'll just mention that setting up the physics constraints on his tail was really hard. Er, um, difficult. It was really difficult. So, um... How do I segue out of this? But when I went to add physical animation to my character, something didn't look quite right. Indeed, this was not the look I was going for. If you look back at this clip, you'll notice that this ragdoll looks pretty strange. Well, it turns out, a while back when I changed the scale of my character, it broke a few other things. So I had to go back and update the physics assets of my wolf character, which took me way longer than I would have thought, but, you know, at least I did have some fun along the way. So with our body physics fixed, it was a matter of fine-tuning the physical animation so it wasn't too floppy or too rigid. Again, this is a tail we're talking about. I used Star Wolf's tail from Smash Bros as inspiration, and did my best to sculpt in some furry details. Also, you might be wondering why there aren't more clips of our walrus friend in this video, and that's just because I haven't taken the time to fix this model yet, but don't worry, he'll be back soon. Anyway, here's the result of the new tail in action, and... Man, this has got me really excited to start working on the new characters. Earlier I mentioned working on the start of the race countdown, but we'll also need to add some behavior to the end of the race trigger. What I have working now is pretty similar to what you'd see in Mario Kart. You finish the race and an AI takes control of your character, it continues for a bit and then comes to a stop. After all players have reached the finish line, the final result screen is displayed with every character's completion time. These initial designs were drawn up by my friend Lucas from Discord. We've also been working on some designs for an in-game player list and also have some more exciting iterations on the way. I took a bit of time to update the boulder sequence at the end of the level too, though this is very much still a work in progress. By changing the slope of these mountains, we can position the snow boulders better so that they cross the tracks laterally instead of sneaking up behind the player. This also gives the players better visibility into the boulders as they come down the mountain, and later I'll show some camera control changes that I think will also help with this sequence. Alright, and now for the features I spent a majority of these last two months working on. Movement mechanics. First of all, why? What if we kept the controls really simple? Technically there's nothing wrong with that, and in fact I think some people might even prefer that. But at the end of the day, I'm making a game that I would want to play. And in my opinion, all good competitive games are easy to play, but challenging to master, providing enough depth for talented players to distinguish themselves from everyone else. So with that established, let's get into implementation. And I'll admit that I'd been dreading working on these movement mechanics quite a bit, since I knew the online multiplayer portion of the work would be pretty daunting. And that's also one of the reasons I delayed this devlog. I'm still fairly new to Unreal Engine, so I needed focused dev time to rewrite a lot of code, to read a lot of code, and debug a lot of code. So I rewrote the skiing movement implementation for the fourth time. Carving is going to be a critical part of the game's mechanics, so I really want that to feel just right, and I'm pretty pleased with where it's at at the moment. And now onto our first new mechanic, the boost. Okay, the name for this one is pretty lame, so if you have any better ideas for what to call this, drop it in the comments below. So, the obvious comparison for the boost is the Mini Turbo from Mario Kart. Similar to the Mini Turbo, it is charged up and upon release it should give the player a burst of speed. Also, just a quick heads up, you'll see a number of clips like this one with older versions of the snow, the landscape, and the lighting as I go into the movement mechanics, and that's just because these are work in progress videos that I took before I made those other changes, just in case there's any confusion. Of course, we're going to need some visual effects, so I did my best to copy this wind tunnel effect using a scrolling mask texture wrapped around a sphere. And this was already looking pretty decent. On top of synchronizing player movement across networked clients, you also have to make sure animations and particle effects are synchronized with movement mechanics. And these are the type of issues that had me banging my head against the wall for quite a while. I also messed around with some cool field of view effects, which you'll see shortly. Now, you might have noticed this little speedometer in the bottom left, and the outer ring here is the carve meter. This meter charges as you carve back and forth. After it's full, you can use a boost at your leisure and start charging your meter again. 
It's pretty subtle right now, but soon I'd like to add more visual indicators when the boost meter is being charged. You can see here that the player's speed is capped around 25 meters per second while regular skiing, but boosting gives a burst of speed and temporarily increases your top speed. The idea is that the player who skis straight down reaches max speed quickly, but the player who carves back and forth is rewarded with a boost which temporarily increases their max speed, allowing them to overtake. The next mechanic I worked on was the bunny hop. The idea behind the bunny hop was to add a spammable move that could add extra mobility and combine with other abilities in interesting ways, though I certainly didn't have all the use cases of this ability fully mapped out when I first implemented it. I'm still calibrating the jump speed and the height, and I think in the future this could be dependent on what character you're using. In general, I want the bunny hop to be fairly small but springy, and of course, fun to use. I wanted to add some drifting abilities by bunny hopping into a turn, but the turn controls were so tight it really didn't feel right. What I ended up doing was adding a brief sliding factor upon landing where you gradually regain traction. I found this jump slide really useful for jumping into turns, and it's also a really effective way to quickly charge the carve meter. At the time I was working on the bunny hop ability, my friend Weppy showed me the game Steep, and I thought it was really cool how you could ski backwards. This is also known as skiing switch by people who know what they're talking about. Then I thought, I wonder what would happen if I would tried doing that in my game. And hey, it works, kinda. If I just turn around the camera, and of course we should probably turn his head around so he's looking where he's going. And just like that, we are skiing switch. One fortunate coincidence I've found is that the sliding factor I've added to the bunny hop makes it really easy to turn around mid-race, which is really handy. Now, you might be wondering, what's the point? Well, for one, I think it could be kind of a cool show-off move, kind of like taunts work in Smash Bros. But also, I think it could have some cool use cases with items. For example, when skiing in reverse, penguin missiles are actually fired backwards, allowing you to snipe players sneaking up behind you. In this clip, I'm using a button to reverse the camera after I turn around. Should skiing switch have any effect on carving or top speed? I'm still figuring this out, so let me know what you guys think. And that brings us to the last movement mechanic I've been working on, the tuck or crouch position. There were a lot of people suggesting this type of mechanic, so thanks for all the input. Tuck position in real life is a position a skier would use to reach maximum speed by reducing air resistance at the cost of mobility, and it works pretty similar in the game the way I've implemented it. You can assume tuck position by holding down the left trigger, and this will allow you to gradually reach a higher max speed, but it greatly limits your ability to turn. Tuck position has a higher max speed than standard skiing, but a lower max speed than a boost provides, so it's still advantageous to carve when possible. You can, however, chain this ability after a boost to maintain a higher speed. You can see here that the player who holds tuck position after boosting maintains a 26 meters per second pace, where the player who does not returns to 25 meters per second. And I think this will create some interesting trade-offs between carving and holding tuck position at certain points of the race. Alright, so with those basic movement mechanics implemented, the general speed of the game has increased significantly, and I found myself revisiting the camera controls. Because of the fast-paced turn controls, locking the camera directly behind the player is a little disorienting. For that reason, I've added considerable rotational lag. What this means is that the camera is always attempting to match the character's rotation, but turns slower than the character, which makes the player's perspective significantly less chaotic during quick movement. And for the most part, this works pretty great. However, there are some moments during sharp turns that the camera doesn't turn quick enough, and you find yourself waiting to get a better view of where you're going. That's when I decided to experiment with a free cam system, where the camera is instead manually controlled using the right stick. This, I've found, is actually very freeing. You can use this method to keep the camera steady while carving back and forth, or turn the camera ahead of you to get a look at other players, or get a better vantage point of obstacles in your path. While doing some playtesting with friends, however, the free cam did take some getting used to, and would often get stuck in strange positions. The final solution I found was actually inspired by GTA driving controls, where the camera can be manually adjusted using the right stick, but upon release it will snap into position behind the player. This is where the camera controls have ended up, and what I like the most about this setup is that the right stick is completely optional, but adds a lot of utility for those who want to use it. 
All right, that about wraps up this devlog. Please consider wishlisting the game on Steam if you haven't already. It's a great way to support the game. Also, it's been a bit longer than usual since the last devlog, but if you're interested in more frequent updates or just want to chat about the game, join the Discord. Oh, and subscribing to the YouTube channel helps too. All right, I think I've plugged everything now. Thank you guys so much for watching and supporting, and I'll see you next time.